The United States is Israel's biggest ally and military weapons supplier, but did this week's vote at the United Nations expose divisions between the two countries? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. After months of defending Israel's actions in Gaza and blocking measures at the United Nations Security Council, the United States changed its position. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield abstained from a vote on Monday, allowing a resolution to pass. It calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the release of all hostages. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a strong rebuke and cancelled high-level meetings scheduled in Washington this week to discuss Israel's military plans in Rafah. The United States has urged Israel not to invade the Gaza city, where over a million displaced Palestinians are sheltering. We believe that a full-scale military operation in Rafah will not just cause civilian harm to the Palestinian people, it will not just hinder the, the flow of humanitarian assistance, most of which is coming in through the Rafah area and being distributed initially uh, through Rafah. Uh, we believe that that kind of operation would hurt Israel's national security. It will leave Israel more isolated in the world. For more, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Jerusalem is Daniel Seidemann. He's a lawyer and founder of the Israeli non-governmental organization Terrestrial Jerusalem. Also with us from Virginia, Trita Parsi is executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. From Minneapolis, Matthew Brodsky is a senior fellow at the Gold Institute for International Strategy, president of Red Axe Strategies and board chair of the American Center for Counter-Extremism. And here with us in our studio, Joel Rubin is a former deputy assistant secretary of state for legislative affairs in the Obama administration. Thanks everyone for being with us. Joel, let's start right here in the studio. Let's get back to that vote at the UN on Monday. The US abstained from that vote which called for an immediate ceasefire. And that was a significant change from the way it has acted up to now in the, US in the UN Security Council. Here's the US ambassador to the UN speaking. Let's watch. We appreciated the willingness of members of this council to take some of our edits and improve on this resolution. Still certain key edits were ignored, including our request to add a condemnation of Hamas. And we did not agree with everything in the resolution. For that reason, we were unfortunately not able to vote yes. So Joel, since that vote, uh, or the resolution rather, was passed, uh, nothing has changed on the ground. In fact, Al Jazeera reports that more than 70 Palestinians were killed in the past 24 hours. Hamas continues to hold uh, the hostages. But looking at this diplomatically, how significant a change was this? Well, you know, Anand, Anand it, uh, it was a symbol of American frustration, quite frankly, with what's happening on the ground and what you described, and a demonstration of a willingness to open up more diplomatic avenues to resolving this conflict. Uh, look, uh, there is no doubt that Joe Biden has been a strong supporter of Israel and its uh, uh, offensive into Gaza, defending southern communities, and rightly taking on Hamas. But there's also a lot of concern, appropriately, in the White House that where Israel is heading and where it's taking this war is going too far. The president said this publicly. This is not a surprise. And I think that the president, he wanted to make sure that the international community understood clearly that that is U.S. policy. It's not just rhetoric. Mm -hmm. It's not just window dressing. And there are some critics here at home mm -hmm. who complain that uh, somehow Joe Biden is, is all talk and no action. This is real action. And at the same time, it maintains American support for Israel. It also shows support for the Palestinian people. And I think it gives our negotiators a little more oomph to try to bring a hostage deal for a temporary ceasefire together. Briefly, Joel, tell me, uh, if the feeling in Washington is that Israel is going too far, yeah. the Israeli position is that their goal is to defeat Hamas. Yeah. How big is that difference? Well, you know, the United States has a lot of experience fighting wars in the Middle East. Yeah. And uh, we learned the hard way that militarily attacking and destroying a terrorist organization does not mean victory. Right. It means a military battle won. There is a lot more nation building that needs to occur, a lot more engagement with the Palestinians, and a lot more regional diplomacy that will ensure that there is true victory. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why the United States, that's why our administration, who, which is deeply experienced in the lessons of the war in Iraq, is trying to get the Israeli policy to shift into that kind of thinking, a day after a scenario. Right. And they see the Rafa invasion as a critical turning point in whether or not there will be an effective day after or not. Matthew, uh, how big a breach uh, is this? In what was once an unconditional, unquestioned, rock-solid relationship between the United States and Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel, he responded by canceling a high-level visit by some of his top security aides to Washington. The Israeli media has been scathing in its condemnation of Prime Minister Netanyahu, acting like a teenager, one commentator said. Another said that Netanyahu is off the rails. Right, that's fine, but we should at least understand that when the media tries to portray this as Netanyahu's war, which is something that a lot of American Democrats try to do, claim this is Netanyahu's deal, and there's a difference between Netanyahu and the actual Israeli people, that that's actually false. At least 80 percent of the Israelis are very much behind the fact that Israel must go into Rafah because Hamas must be 100 percent defeated. Um, when it comes to looking at the day after, any time that Israel or the United States is going to try to empower anyone inside of Gaza, they're killed by Hamas. The only way to get to a day after is once Hamas is defeated. It's frankly what the United States would do. And I do think it's a little bit rich that we have uh, the United States with many failures in Middle East, uh, trying to lecture Israel on how it should behave by trying to force it to negotiate with terrorists that the United States would never negotiate with. We have not put any pressure on Qatar, no pressure on Iran, but all the United States pressure is apparently on Israel. So Hamas continues to reject every single deal, including the release of seven to 800 convicted terrorists in Israeli jails for just 40 uh, Israeli hostages held in Gaza. And Ismail Haniyeh, the leader of Hamas, immediately jumps on a plane to do a victory lap in Iran. And that's the result of the United States and the Biden administration uh, playing at the UN Security Council, which weakens allies and strengthens America's adversaries. Daniel, good to see you again. Um, as I said, you know, Netanyahu canceled that visit by some of his top security aides to Washington. Um, in response to that vote at the United Nations. Um, Haaretz newspaper, the Israeli newspaper, said Netanyahu has become Israel's agent of destruction and a burden. In Israel, what are the implications of what is taking place right now for the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu? It's difficult to say what the long-term implications are, but I can say that this is not a dispute or a rupture of ties between Israel and the United States. Netanyahu picked a fight with the president for reasons of his own. That is widely accepted here in Israel. Now, there's some speculation, why did he do that? Some say he picked the fight with the president because he wants to be stopped. He doesn't want to invade Rafa as he's being pressed by his own government or parts of his own government, but he doesn't want to be seen as refusing to do so. So what better than to pick a fight with the president and then blame him for stabbing us in the back? Others say this is all about his political base. Toss them red meat. Right? Netanyahu is way down in the polls. His coalition remains firm, but he is highly unpopular give the base what they want to hear. And there are those who have said, we, Israel, through mediation of Qatar, Egypt, and the United States, are not far from a deal. And Netanyahu wants to make that deal impossible because his personal interest takes priority over the national interest, and his interest is in staying in power and prolonging the war is part of that strategy. Virtually nobody in Israel takes Netanyahu at face value. Mm -hmm. 
Trude Parsi, uh, in the immediate aftermath of that uh, United Nations vote, uh, the U.S. backtracked a little bit and said that that resolution that was passed is non-binding. I mean, that's unprecedented. And many legal experts, people who understand international law, say it is binding. So what do you make of the U.S. position, abstaining on the one hand and then saying afterwards, well, it's non-binding? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And let me just uh, say one thing first on that issue. There is not a debate. This is a binding resolution. This is a Security Council resolution under Chapter 6. Had it been under Chapter 7, it would mean that also the United Nations uh, Security Council would have been able to authorize force to implement it. But it was under Chapter 6, so no such mechanism is included in it. That, however, does not mean that it is not binding. It certainly is. It's only the United States or the Biden administration that has taken this position, and this has tremendously angered a lot of the other members of the council, as well as the UN as a whole. And I'll get into that a little bit deeper. But first to say, this was a huge missed opportunity for the administration because they finally, finally allowed a resolution, six months into this conflict, 32,000 people dead, to come out uh, uh, with a resolution calling for a ceasefire and the uh, immediate and unconditional release of all of the hostages. And that was a moment that could have been used to bridge some of the differences that have been growing between the United States and the other council members. But instead of building on that, the administration essentially then backtracked and further infuriated members by making the statement that this is non-binding, which is critical because it's not just incorrect, it actually undermines the authority of the UN Security Council uh, and the UN as a whole, at a time when the administration otherwise is talking about the need for a rules-based international order, et cetera, et cetera. So this is highly problematic. I think their own goal, uh, quite uh, unfortunate, mindful of the fact that they finally had taken a step in the right direction, and then they undermined it. Trita, one other thing. Uh, if we look at the current circumstances, the political environment, do you believe that Biden's decision was driven more by domestic political considerations in an election year rather than any genuine concern for the plight of Palestinians in Gaza. I think, unfortunately, the Biden administration has had a huge difficulty expressing genuine empathy with the Palestinians. And that may have been both because of a lack of capacity or, and perhaps a uh, political calculation. This decision, I think, was driven by a couple of factors, the two most important ones are the fact that the domestic opposition to this war and to Biden's support for the war has been growing very fast. The latest Gallup poll just showed that only 18 percent of Democrats support uh, Israel's war in Gaza, only, uh, only 36 percent of Americans as a whole. And the number has been dropping. The number of people supporting uh, Israel in Gaza has been dropping in all demographics, independents, Democrats, and Republicans. Uh, and I think after the recent elections in Michigan, the uncommitted vote, et cetera, it's really rattled the White House, and I think they realized that they need to shift. But there was also another thing that was very critical in this. This resolution was put forward by the entire group of non-permanent members of the U.N. Security Council, the all 10 of them, which includes two of America's strongest Asian allies, uh, Japan and South Korea, as well as three European allies. This was the strongest possible message these countries could have sent to Biden saying, enough is enough, we need to have a ceasefire, and you need to allow this to pass. Because if he had issued a veto, mm -hmm. then he would have stood against all of these very, very close allies right. of the United States, again, for the sake of allowing uh, the Israelis to continue to kill Palestinians with no end in sight and with no strategic goal being able to be achieved. So I think in some ways, the council members, frankly, cornered the White House and forced it to go for an abstention, mindful of the fact that the U.N. ambassador in her speech on Friday, when the American resolution was vetoed, yeah. said that if another resolution comes up uh, that doesn't contain some of the elements of the American resolution, yeah. then the council would remain blocked, uh, uh, meaning that right. the U.S. would put in a veto. That threat was made. Thankfully, that threat was not acted upon, and I think it's because uh, the unity of the council as a whole vis-a-vis -vis the United States on that issue. Joel, there was another development in the past few days, and that was the release of what was a really blistering report from the United Nations Human Rights Council. Its head, also known as the Special Rapporteur, Francesca Albanese, she described her own report as, quote, anatomy of a genocide. Let's listen to part of what she had to say. 
the catastrophic situation I investigated is known, as it has been broadcast to the world in real time by its victims. Astoundingly, rather than halting its momentum, a minority of powerful member states have provided military, economic and political support for the atrocity, compounding the devastation it has wrought for the Palestinians. In this assault, the sixth and most egregious in 16 years, Israel has killed more than 30,000 Palestinians, including 13 thousand children, more than the children killed in all conflicts worldwide in four previous years. So Albanese also called for an arms embargo and other kinds of sanctions against Israel. That's highly unlikely, but what do you make of this report? Well, Albanese is no friend of Israel. I'm just yeah. going to put that right there on the docket. Uh, but what she is arguing and articulating is what I think is at the core of why we saw the UN vote unfold as it did. I don't think it's domestic politics. I think the President Biden and his team are looking at this and saying, this is going in the wrong direction. Uh, Israel, you are a close ally. We want to support you. But we don't want you so isolated and so ostracized around the world that your ability to actually live in peace and security is diminished. Mm -hmm. And we want to provide a lifeline to this devastating number of Palestinian civilians in harm's way right now. And we're not seeing enough action on the ground to get us there. I think it's, and I've said this before, I'll say this again, I think that the IDF, the Israeli Defense mm. Forces, should be embarrassed that the United States is having to go in to provide humanitarian assistance in a, a territory that is occupied, again, by our own ally, by Israel, uh, building a, a floating port, airdropping uh, aid. This is ridiculous. And the Palestinians, the Gazans, are suffering and dying unnecessarily, and it undermines Israel's long-term standing, its ability to get to peace. And one more thing I just want to say that Matt brought up. Uh, you know, the United States, our experience does matter. We don't have all the answers, but we have a lot of wisdom. And for the United States to not provide that wisdom and guidance to an ally who we are providing billions of dollars of weaponry to, which is, by the way, pressure on Hamas, yeah. there is a lot of pressure on Hamas provided by the American taxpayer right now through arms. Uh, I think we would be failing our ally Israel if we didn't try to raise these kinds of concerns now before it gets worse. And so I, I think that that's what's going on. That's why uh, we're taking this position at the UN. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you see the president very concerned about where this is heading. And when you say wisdom, this is wisdom born of experience. Hey, look, nobody has a, a, a perfect uh, uh, hourglass of a, 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 a crystal ball of what will work ideally yeah. 100%. But, you know, Lloyd Austin, our Secretary of Defense, fought ISIS in northern Iraq. Yeah. Should he not be listened to? He understands counterinsurgency. Okay. And I think it's, it's important right. to hear him. All right, let me get uh, Matthew's response to that. Look, the United States has had a policy of realignment in the Middle East, strategic realignment since President Obama was in office. The nuclear deal was actually a Trojan horse meant to lock in this alignment, whereby the United States basically kicks in the shins our traditional allies, that includes Israel, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and to try to reach an accommodation with Iran. Trump obviously destroyed that. Biden came into office with the same staff as the Obama people, and he's been trying to resurrect it. The problem is that what happened is October 7th, and that shows that Iran is behind this, and it shows the fundamental flaws of the Obama-Biden foreign policy. And so Israel understands something that everyone in the Middle East does, and frankly, most Americans do when you actually pull them. When you go to war or war is launched against you, your objective is to win. You don't prop up terrorists inside of Gaza, which is frankly what the policy that the Biden administration is following right now. Hamas will be destroyed, and I don't think people understand. Israel sees this as an existential threat. Mm. They will destroy Hamas and won't allow them to be in power afterward. It doesn't matter if the United States is going to cut off its weapon supplies, yeah. so they'll use dumb bombs instead of precision weapons. They see this as something that has to be done, and that's not just Netanyahu. If you had early elections in Israel today, the Israelis would still elect mm. someone who would carry this out. Right. So that's going to happen. And Biden's legacy of failures are not lessons that Israel can learn from. 
Trudy, I know you've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of your work is focused on the politics of the Middle East. What do you make of Matthew's assessment there? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know where to begin in terms of uh, addressing uh, the many, many flaws in it. The idea that the Iran deal was a realignment for the United States, throwing the Saudis and the uh, Israelis under the bus, uh, is frankly laughable. Uh, this was a deal because it is imperative to make sure that the Iranians do not go uh, and get a nuclear weapon. It was also imperative to make sure that the United States did not get dragged into another war in the region. Uh, the fact that Trump destroyed that deal and the fact that Biden has failed to get back into it, although it's not entirely his fault, is to the detriment of U.S. interests. Uh, and uh, the realignment uh, is actually not one in which the United States would take Iran's side or anyone else's side. The realignment that is needed, that uh, Obama's deal made somewhat possible, although it was never acted upon, and which incidentally Trump said that he wanted to do is a realignment in which the United States is no longer militarily hegemonic in the region, doesn't have 19 bases in the region, brings the troops home instead of having them sitting there as uh, sitting ducks and getting attacked by all kinds of militias. That realignment was actually undermined by Trump's policies in the Middle East, even though I do personally believe that he genuinely wanted to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And the first big mistake he did in that was to kill the Iran deal, because the Iran deal would have actually helped the United States slowly but surely be able to reduce its military presence in the Middle East. Daniel, uh, there were two things that actually happened right after that uh, resolution was passed at the United Nations Security Council. One is the one we've been talking about, the fact that the United States said that it is a non-binding resolution. Uh, the other was a statement that was released by the United States State Department just a couple of days later, in which it said that Israel is using the weapons supplied to it by the United States in line with international law and that Israel is not blocking any international humanitarian aid from getting into the uh, territory in, into Gaza. Um, firstly, is that the case? And is this a case of the United States trying to placate everybody, keep everyone satisfied without actually achieving much? For many years, Israel has not been held accountable for any of its actions by the United States. What we've seen in recent days, particularly concerning the UN resolution, is an indication that the period of impunity is over. But in many ways, it is a trumped up crisis. We're our, our war cabinet, Gantz, uh, Eisenkot, Gallant, to sit quietly with the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of Defense Austin, there would be a meeting of minds uh, to say that we have to take Rafa uh, now, is to say we need to sacrifice 134 hostages, because taking Rafa now basically means there is no possibility of saving or little possibility of saving those hostages. Joel, a couple of things I want to ask you about from what Daniel just told us. Yeah. Uh, he says the period of immunity is over. That's one of the things. The other is that, you know, we are seeing President Bison face increasing criticism right here in the United States uh, from Democrats, from supporters. Uh, yeah. I mean, if we look at prominent Jewish donors, they've signed a letter calling for the president to pull back his unconditional support for Israel's war effort, warning that it could damage his re-election prospects in November. Uh, question is, is Biden listening? Very good question. Yeah. Uh, without a doubt, the president and his team hear those voices. Uh, I think that there are some other significant voices, like Senator Chuck Schumer, mm -hmm. the Senate Majority Leader, the uh, most high, uh, senior most ever elected uh, official of Jewish heritage in the United States, and a long time, uh, essentially right wing uh, 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 allied uh, supporter of Israel. Very, he opposed the Iran nuclear deal, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, he called out Bibi Netanyahu and Hamas and Prime Minister Abbas and Itamar Ben-Gavir and tried to create some support for the president because that support is, is, is certainly eroding. But uh, Democrats uh, are going to back Joe Biden at the polls in November, no doubt. But I think between now and then, we're going to continue to see 
uh, a lot of American Jews in particular yeah. uh, expressed deep concern about the humanitarian costs of this without seeing the long-term peace and security. This is very important. Uh, if Prime Minister Netanyahu were to come out and say, I support a two-state solution, we would see a different political dynamic. But when President Biden and Secretary Blinken, longtime supporters of Israel, called for that, the day after Prime Minister Netanyahu said, no way, I'm not even talking about it. In fact, I've blocked it for 30 years. That's not a good message, and that's not a message that American Jews want to hear. Matthew, we're also hearing from uh, many people who say that Israel is becoming increasingly isolated because of its attacks on Gaza. I mean, even Donald Trump, one of Israel's staunchest supporters, is warning that Israel, as he put it, is losing the world. And we just had a Gallup poll, which was published uh, today, um, which says that 55% of Americans disapprove of Israeli actions in Gaza. I mean, is Israel factoring all of this into its policies, its strategies, as it continues this war in Gaza? Yes. But all of that, and incidentally, there are a lot of polls one can look at. Uh, the bottom line, though, for Israel is that it has a number one priority that is above everything else. And that is not demonstrating in the Middle East that you can go across the Gaza border, rape, kill, murder babies and women, hold them hostage, and then sue for peace and for conditions to return to the day before afterward. In the Middle East, when someone does something like this, if you want to have any respect or have any possibility of any peace in the future, you must destroy that enemy. Israel understands that in a way that I guess the West does not understand, and that's their problem. So Israel is still going to end up doing what it has to do. I mean, and the point, I think, should be clear, when it comes to what the Biden plan is in at Biden plan is in how he's responding in terms of his election prospects. The fact is, it's just that his strategic realignment plan hasn't worked after this length of time. The Trump plan was basically to increase aid and to build up America's allies and to isolate Iran. The strategic realignment plan is to create some mythical balance that will make everything all right while the U.S. withdraws, so that we give Iran a seat at the table who paints on their missiles death to Israel and death to America. So the U.S. is doing nothing to make the region safer. It's basically courting a policy where the entire region is going to be in turmoil and will create the conditions for an everlasting war. Uh, Trita, very quickly, I've just got about a minute left, but on the question of uh, Israel being isolated, um, is there something of an emerging division uh, between the United States and its allies in Europe? And we've, we've been hearing some pretty withering criticism from the uh, EU's uh, head of uh, foreign affairs, Joseph Borrell. Um, should the, does it matter? Obviously, it matters in the long run because for, the, uh, for Israel to be able to be prosperous, it cannot be uh, at odds with the international community in the manner that it is now as a result of its own decisions. Uh, it did not have to react to Hamas's terrorist attack uh, in the manner that it did, and it certainly did not have to engage in this type of indiscriminate carpet bombing of Gaza that has, as you pointed out earlier on, killed more than 13,000 children. Uh, so it has chosen a specific path that is clearly to its own detriment. It has split Europe. You have certain states in Europe that have taken very strong positions yeah. in favor of Europe, uh, Israel, which seems to largely because, be because of their sense of dependency on the United States as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right. But you have other states such as Spain, Ireland, uh, uh, Belgium, that have taken very strong positions uh, against uh, the human rights violations and the war crimes that Israel is committing. Right. Internationally, however, in the global south, broadly, Israel has never been this isolated since 1991. Right. And it doesn't seem to be something that will quickly be fixed in any way, shape, or form. Take a note of, for instance, the South African claim against Israel on yeah. genocide and the broad support that has received in the global south. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C.